Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, cryptocurrency, fintech, cannabis, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful Tri-State area. Welcome to our 126th episode, three years on the air and going strong. It's always such a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you for listening and interacting with me on social media. That truly does make it all worthwhile. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. Also remember that we're now live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern. And of course, all episodes of A Moment of Zen are now streaming 24-7 on Kathy Ireland's Your Home TV platform. You can always find us on our YouTube channel at Zen Sams. We have such a great show lined up for you today. A big shout out to our newest sponsors, Once Upon a Coconut and CO2Lift.com. Now, in our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, we're featuring Jen Drummond world record holder, author, influencer, and speaker. Post a near-death accident, Jen's son dares her to climb Mount Everest for her 40th birthday. Now, she is the first woman to climb all seven summits, enlisting her into the Guinness Book of World Records. Tune in to hear the secrets to how Jen did it and how you can apply her hard-earned lessons to learning how to never quit. In our culinary and wine segment brought to you by Biche Cucina, today we're featuring celebrity chef Ashish Alfred. He combines his classical training from the French Culinary Institute in Manhattan. He's a serial entrepreneur. He owns tons of restaurants in Maryland. And to his credit, he's been featured regularly in the media. He's a little celebrity himself. Today, we're here to chat food, career, and the global rise in vegan and plant-based eating. Can't wait to get his opinion on that one. In our Travel Treasure segment brought to you by Navi Travel, today we're featuring Carl Pierre a serial entrepreneur that has achieved financial freedom through owning home care agencies, healthcare staffing firms, and a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio throughout the world. He's going to come on today, chat affordable travel, the importance of traveling and seeing the world, and his tips for the key to success in entrepreneurship. Stay tuned for our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut featuring the incredible Jen Drummond. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, 100% pure coconut water. Imagine a drink that's nutrient-rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Enter Once Upon a Coconut, the absolute best tasting coconut water you will ever try. Available in four refreshing flavors, pure, chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. Do your taste buds a favor and pick up some today at onceuponacoconut.com. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our Hydration with Heart segment, brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, we're featuring Jen Drummond, world record holder, author, influencer, and speaker. Now, post a near-death accident, Jen's son dared her to climb Mount Everest for her 40th birthday. Jen, now 43, is the first woman to climb all seven summits, enlisting her into the Guinness Book of World Records. She's a mom to seven kids, all names beginning with the letter J. She had a former career in finance before launching her third book, coming out next year, and get ready to embark on a journey of personal growth with this one. Jen's experiences on the mountains serve as a metaphor for achieving life goals and inspiring continuous self-improvement. In her book, Quit Proof, Seven Strategies to Build Resilience and Achieve Your Life Goals, she shares her struggles and victories and delivers potent insights into achieving balance, setting meaningful objectives, and living life to its fullest. This past June, Jen became the first woman in the world to conquer the seven second summits. Life goal reached. Learn the secrets to how Jen did it and how you can apply hard-earned lessons to learning how to never quit. Welcoming now to the show is the amazing Jen Drummond. Welcome to the show, superstar. Woohoo! Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to chat with you. You are one amazing human. Oh, we're all amazing humans. Well, you specifically, my near. Now, tell me about your near-death accident and experience and how, in the split of a minute, your life very quickly changed. 
Yes. So I was driving back from a nearby town um, and on the highway, looking outside at the reservoir. I saw that it wasn't frozen over, thinking about it a little bit, got my attention back onto the road and realized that I was coming up very fast to a semi truck. So I looked in my rear view mirror, went to go into the left hand lane. He had a trailer. Somehow the trailer hit the passenger side um, headlight. I flipped end over end, rolled sideways into the median and luckily survived that accident. They rebuilt it about 50 different times because it's a dangerous area. Could not rebuild a scenario where I lived. So that was very amazing um, to walk away from that. Definitely changes your perspective on everything. I remember going home to my kids that day from the hospital checkup and they were fighting, of course. And instead of me wanting to neutralize the fight, I just sat there and I was like, oh, wow, how amazing is it that we have two people from the same household that have entirely different opinions that are so convinced that they want their sibling to believe what they believe. And it just changed everything in my life to say, listen, this is all beautiful, all of it. Like, let's enjoy, let's experience, let's make the most out of this one magic life. Yeah, because at that point, you were just so grateful to be alive. <laughs> yes, so yes, yes. I'm like, the principal office, I'm okay. I'm here to take this call. Let's continue. <laughs> exactly. Now, it's 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 just, a, it's just like that. Things change. Now, mountain climbers consider the second highest mountains on all seven continents to be technically more complex than the seven highest. You became the first woman to conquer all seven summits. And this is a remarkable feat that has earned you a place in the Guinness Book of World Records. Could you say, could you share uh, some of the most memorable moments or challenges perhaps that you faced during your journey to these summits and how these experiences really have shaped your perspective uh, on life? Yeah, so every mountain has had its own story, which has been humbling and awe-inspiring in and of itself. When I went to K2 in 2021, I had a teammate die in an avalanche and another one lose his hand to frostbite. I was on the mountain when all this information was provided. I had the opportunity to continue up the mountain or turn around and go home. I decided that it was more important who we are as people than what we achieve. So I came down to be with my team and put the people over peaks. When I got back to the United States, I was definitely frustrated without, with, you know, I didn't summit, I didn't have the success, but I was successful in showing up as I wanted to. I was a person that put people first. And I think that's sometimes hard when we're going after big quests. The story comes full circle in 2022. When I went back to go summit K2, I was made aware that some people wanted to summit from Pakistan and they didn't have the resources to climb their country's prized peak. So I brought over gear and helped sponsor the first Pakistani female to stand on top of K2. Oh, so when I summited, wow. I felt- Wow, oh yeah. my, I just got chills, Jen, that's incredible. I know, so when I summited, I'm like, woohoo! But then when she summited, it was waterworks because I have daughters and I know what it's like to have daughters see people that look like them in these positions or in these roles or on top of these mountains in this case. And it just goes to show that when we do the right thing, things happen for us and greater things are possible. So true. And this all started on a dare. I, yeah. I, I read that your son dared you to climb Mount Everest. Yes. So I was originally climbing a mountain called Amma de Blanc. Because when I said, hey, I'm going to launch my 40 decade with this big mountain, what mountain should I climb? Everybody said, Ama de Blom. It's a gorgeous mountain in Nepal. It's Paramount Pictures logo. And I'm like, okay, perfect. Well, my son's struggling with his math homework one day. And I'm like, listen, buddy, we do hard things. And he goes to me, if we do hard things, why are you climbing a mountain called I'm a dumb blonde instead of a real mountain like Mount Everest? I said, Ama de Blom, honey. Not I'm a dumb blonde, but thank you. <laughs> And then I thought about it. I'm like, hey, if Everest is the real mountain to him, maybe I should oh, climb Everest funny. because that will show him we're capable of all of it. Oh, that was so funny. Uh, I'm a dumb blonde. Oh, God, you can't make this stuff up. That's great. Now, it's interesting because I always love a saying uh, by Winston Churchill, a famous quote, continuous effort, not strength or intelligence is the key to unlocking our potential. Yes. It's interesting. Now, how did you prepare physically and mentally for these extreme climbs? I mean, were there any unique training routines or techniques that you used? Yeah. Well, having seven children will mentally prepare you for about anything. So that <laughs> helps naturally. And then physically, I live in Park City. So living in Park City, I have mountains all the way around me. When the ski resort would close at night, I'd be able to ski up it or hike up it and then ski down, um, which helped because that's what you do in the mountains. 
I have seven kids. I run a business. So I also had to really manage time tightly. So I would be that mom that would be at soccer practice with a 12 inch step and a backpack full of water bottles, watching soccer and then doing my step up so I could get exercise in and support my kids and what they were doing. Um, so you just have to get creative and figure out how you're going to make it work. Where there's a will, there's a way. And yeah. and again, another famous quote by Calvin Coolidge. He said, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. So press on. It's press true. on. Yes. <laughs> now, climbing such diverse peaks must have, without a doubt, exposed you to various cultures and landscapes. Can you describe how these experience these experiences enriched your perspective? Yeah. You know, I think we get so caught up in the stories and the bubbles in our culture. When you get to travel to another location and just see a different way of doing things. It lets you say, oh, wow, there's more possibility in how this can look or how this can show up. I'll never forget being in Kenya, and it was around Valentine's Day. And in the United States, Valentine's Day leaks out of every single everything. And over there, it was just a simple, I love you, I see you, how are you? And it just reminded me of how we don't need pillows for every holiday. We don't need all of this stuff. It's who we are and how we can show up and support one another and see each other in our pursuits. And that just really changed on how we've done our lives here. A lot less things and a lot more experiences. Without a doubt. And that you have written the manuscript on, on perseverance and on, and, and on truly believing not only in yourself, but in humanity, because like you said, you, you put people first and it always comes full circle. I mean, karma I believe in karma and it's it's one of those things where in life I say to people, look, you never know who you're going to meet and how that person is going to change your perspective on life. There are no coincidences. Treat everybody with dignity and grace and go where there's no path and leave a great big trail. And that's what's important. I mean, perseverance, in fact, is failing 19 times and succeeding the 20th. Right. So, yeah, I mean, listen, so you achieved a world record and this requires meticulous planning. What were some of the logistical aspects that you needed to manage to accomplish this feat? I mean, there's there's a lot involved here. Yeah, there is a lot involved and mountains have different seasons that you climb them in. So that's why we see Mount Everest typically summited in May or you see K2 summited in July or you see Mount Tyree in Antarctica summited in January. Those are the seasons that it's safest to climb those mountains. So I was looking at the goal saying, okay, who can be climbed what season? How much time is it going to take? How much time am I away from my home? How am I going to have my kids still be supported while I'm gone? When I went to climb Mount Everest, it would be the longest I'd ever been away from home. I went to the kids' school. I told the teachers and I said, hey, I'm not going to be here. My grand mom's coming in. Grandma's going to be there. But they might need a little extra bit of love and grace during this time frame. Well, in sharing that struggle or that concern, the school stepped up and said, hey, let's do a what's your Everest campaign. So then I went in and talked about setting Everest-like goals. The kids colored little hikers and had a flag and they put what their Everest goal was on that flag. I had a tracking device while I was climbing in um, Nepal. So then the kids could see where I was on the mountain. Wow. Yeah. And then at base camp, you can actually do Zoom calls back to the schools here. So I did some Zoom calls to answer questions on, you know, where you went to the bathroom and what you ate and all the things that kids care about. And so my children, even though I was gone for a long period of time, felt so loved and so seen because my community stepped up in a way that they wouldn't have known had I not said, here's where I'm falling short. Or here's my concern. How can we work together to bridge this gap? And I really feel that when we learn to say, here's what I need to the right people, solutions are provided and it makes it such a better, more enjoyable experience for everybody. Well, you definitely have a community around you. And when you, when you, when there, where, when there's a will, there's a way. And not only did you find a way to climb that mountain, but you got everybody involved. I mean, it does really take a village. So yeah. You, you, played that one out nicely. Now, were there any specific moments or summits that stand out to you as the most rewarding or unforgettable? You know, when I was in Antarctica, 
it has not been climbed by that many people. I think maybe 20 people before us. So our team was 20 through 25 on the summits. There had been one female that climbed it before, and I got to meet with her before I went to the mountain, which was amazing. So I could ask her all the questions of what should I eat? How many hand warmers do I need? What things do I need to look out for? What it just helps to have knowledge when we're doing things from people that have been there before. When I woke up to do the summit day, I remember looking outside of my tent thinking, wow, if I would have been born when my mom or my grandma were an entirely different era, this would never be possible. And so that entire climb, I was carrying our flag just saying, look where we've come world. Like, look at what we're doing with our time, what we get to experience, what we get to empower, what we get to to say, and no matter what part of the world we are in, our flag matters, who we are matters, and it has a ripple effect on what's possible for the next generation or those around us to take that flag even further. And that was just a really important moment for me to realize that we all are so significant in moving society forward and making possibilities available to others. And I'm just so grateful for all of it. Wow. I appreciate you so much. I mean, you are so touching and inspirational. And thank you so much for sharing your your incredible story with us, because that is one brand new perspective on how to really look at things. And you are refreshing. And this is a question I have now. Climbing, of course, can be a dangerous pursuit. But how did you prioritize safety during these expeditions? Um, Well, we're always roped off to one another. We're always doing triple double checks on things. There's two mountains I turned around on. So K2 and Mount Logan, I just didn't feel they were safe. The mountains are always going to be there. So remembering that we can always come back. Uh, We don't have to do everything. It's not a linear path to success. And so just accepting the fact that this isn't the season, do some work, come back again and come back stronger with more knowledge and more safety. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Now, you're the first woman to achieve this feat, and it's quite inspiring to many. What advice would you give to aspiring female adventurers out there? Yeah. You know, we have these things inside of us that light us up, that make us who we are. When I moved to Park City and we were shopping at Costco, I looked outside the store and I saw all the mountains and I was telling my mom, I can't wait to climb every one of these. My mom looked at him. She's like, there is not one thing I want to do about those mountains except look at them from here. But when it comes to decorating a bookshelf, she can figure out all the pretty things to put together to have it be the most gorgeous bookshelf you've ever seen. And just understanding that each one of us has this different story, this different view or this different idea of what we want to do with our lives. And it's beautiful when we allow that and step into that and experience that. Because when I do me, I give you permission to do you. That is so true. And I love what you said. My takeaway in all of this is community and relying on others. Because again, joy can can be magnified if we're around others. We all know that intuitively. If you're watching a really funny movie by yourself, that's pretty good, right? But if you're watching a really funny movie with your best friend, you're looking over and sharing the laughter together, that kind of feels a lot better. And the emotions we experience, good or bad, get more intense when we experience them together. And this also explains why negativity tends to spread like wildfire given the right context, a toxic office environment, for example. So I always like to keep things positive and you are so upbeat. So thank you, me, thank you for making me feel so, so uh, blessed to, to encounter somebody who's had a second lease on life and is so appreciative and just looks at life uh, with a glass half full and such a positive attitude. You are amazing. Well, thank you. Here's what I say. We don't get to choose when we die, but we sure get to choose how we live. And every day we have a choice to show up and live life as big as we want it. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on. You're awesome. Thank you. That was our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut. That was the incredible Jen Drummond. Do check her out directly on her website at jendrummond.com or you can check her out on the gram at the Jen Drummond. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen 
is brought to you by Your Home TV. Hi, this is Kathy Ireland here on A Moment of Zen, brought to you by Your Home TV. We've developed an all-inclusive subscription-free network that you're going to love, whether it's financial freedom, fashion, beauty, health and wellness, wonderful weddings, travel and culture, cooking, entertainment, and short-form documentaries, programming for everyone. Classic films and new shows, including Kathy Ireland Presents American Dreams. We've developed this network just for you. Please check out yourhometv.com. Tune in to A Moment of Zen, Saturday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. on WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our culinary and wine segment brought to you by BJ Cucina, today we're featuring celebrity chef Shish Alfred. He combines his classical training from the French Culinary Institute in Manhattan. A serial entrepreneur with multiple Maryland restaurants to his credit, Chef Al is regularly featured in the media, even competed on Food Network's Cutthroat Kitchen and Chopped. Now, overcoming an addiction to drugs and alcohol, Chef Alfred has frequently shared his journey on recovery and redemption. He was named Maryland's Chef of the Year in 2019 by the Maryland Restaurant Association. Today, he's here to chat food, career, and the global rise in vegan and plant-based eating. Now, outside of countries and cultures where abstaining from animal products was part of spiritual or moral beliefs, diets that limited or excluded meat, dairy products, and eggs have often been seen as fads, especially in the U.S. and many European countries. Plus, meat-free food options used to be difficult to find outside of certain stores, and even then, they weren't always appetizing. But now, all that is changing, and quickly, in a big way. The global rise in plant-based foods has officially arrived. Welcoming now to the show is the amazing chef Ashish Alfred. Welcome, superstar. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Absolutely. Okay, let's jump right into this headliner and then we can circle back to your amazing career. So even as little as less than a decade ago, those identifying as vegetarian, vegan or plant based were often viewed as weird or extreme, more to the domain of hippies and activists rather than large numbers of everyday people. And many headlines made veganism sound like a surefire way to become nutrient deficient, even using fear tactics to prevent parents from raising their kids on plant foods. Where does a plant-based lifestyle stand today? And can you still balance out the flavors and nutrients just as effectively, Chef? I think the short answer to your question, to the second part of your question is yes. You know, uh, I, I think that as far as making flavors work, you can make them work. Making textures work, you can make them work. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think like a lot of other things that we have seen grow in popularity, whether it is... Um, <clears throat> an alternative lifestyle, whatever it might be. I need to be really careful what I say. Whatever it might be, I think that there is a, there is just a, a growing desire among people to, to find different ways of living and, and getting through their day to day. Um, I think that, you know, for me as a chef, the frustrating part of it is when people don't know what they're talking about, right? Like people will come in and uh, they, they, they expect you at a steakhouse to have, you know, vegan options. Uh, that, you know, that's where it gets a little bit frustrating for me. Like, why didn't you do your research before you showed up to the restaurant? Um, but sorry, yeah, no, I get it. No, 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 you're right. And it's interesting because you, you're right. You could balance out those nutrients. And the, the, the plant-based lifestyle today is very popular. Like you said, people are just expecting that it's, you know, available, readily available at every type of restaurant. And it's just not the case. But in 2020, there was a plant-based um, study done and the plant-based dairy and meat sales were over $29 billion and they were projected to increase to $162 billion by the year 2030. This means that that plant-based meat and dairy alternatives are already making up nearly 10% of the so-called global protein foods market. And according to the Bloomberg Intelligence Report, uh, plant-based food sales are expected to increase fivefold by the year 2030 chef so it's interesting because you know many people have have observed uh, that millennials seem to be central drivers of this worldwide shift away from consuming animal products and really normalizing you know plant-based eating and leading consumer demand but the plant-based movement is bigger than any one generation because everyone from celebrities to athletes to entire companies including google and countries as big as china are supporting the movement to eat more plant-based foods so there's definitely something there but um that's just my opinion now i'm going to shift to your journey 
I'm going to shift to your journey. So overcoming addiction to drugs and alcohol, you free, you frequently share your road of recovery and redemption. What was the catalyst to turning your life around? Um, I mean, to put it simply, I think, you know, you almost die a couple times. And <laughs> unfortunately for me, it took a couple times. Uh, and it just became a time for me to do something different. Um, you know, my, my family was a big Played really a big role. Uh, they supported me in my early endeavors as a chef. And uh, when they kind of drew the line in the sand and they said, hey, we don't we don't really want anything to do with you unless you do something different. Uh, it was time for me to make some changes. But I think that the major catalyst was uh, I <clears throat> I overdosed in the middle of the road. I uh, passed out, fell over, busted my chin open, spit out my teeth, super glued my face shut. Um, so uh, bad day at the office. <laughs> Just a little, right? But you know what? You picked up the pieces of that very broken puzzle and you put yourself back together again, stronger than ever. So congratulations on that. Now, how did you get started in the culinary arts and how would you describe your cooking style? Um, I got started kind of totally by accident. You know, I did uh, I did the community college thing for a little while. Mom got tired of paying for classes uh, and I needed to find something to do. Um, so. I went to culinary school kind of on a whim, just looking for a ticket to New York City. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of fell in love with uh, with, with uh, the structure, the, the simplicity, the, the regimen of, uh, of being in a kitchen. And I, I think that that's kind of emulated in my culinary style. Uh, you know, I'm not the guy that's trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you know, there's you've got phenomenal chefs that do like really out of the box things. That's not me. Uh, not saying that I don't consider myself a good chef, but I, I like to keep it simple, seasonal, uh, flavor forward, um, you know, things that make sense. Yeah. And you, and I think the simplicity, there's, you know, a gentle strength is stronger. There's less and more. Right. I mean, there's more and less. And and over the next 10 years, it's expected that the U.S. is going to need about 10,000 personal chefs. Small but niche market that you seem to have total control over in Baltimore and beyond. So, again, congratulations. Now, the context in which to view the private chef industry is that one of the gig economy, so to speak, instead of renting a house or catching a ride, one is renting an experience with a private chef. Um, now you're very much in demand, not just your, it's not just your cooking, it's you. You are the rock star of their night. Would you call yourself an entertainer? I think that food stimulates people the same way that music and art does. So I think that if, if you're going to be a successful chef today, uh, you got to be able to dance the dance. Um, you know, it's not just about what you put on the plate. It's about, you know, what you bring, uh, what you bring to your own brand as a chef. And you do that effectively well. I mean, you are a celebrity chef. You have a lot of uh, celebrities and VIPs following you. Uh, lots of friends that are supporting your restaurants and even dining at them. So it's quite interesting the way that you've really not only turned your life around, but you are your own brand. It goes beyond culinary arts. This is an entire business. It's your entrepreneurial. Now, how many restaurants do you currently own and where? And I'm interested to know how do they all differ, but I know that they all remain in theme. Talk to me about that. So right now we have two Duck Duck Geese, one in Baltimore, one in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are in the process of opening our very first Good Ducking Burger, which should be done any day now. Um, we are doing we have Osteria Parada, which is two months old. And then we have the Anchor Bar, which is a tavern space also here in Baltimore. So I think the common denominator across the spaces is is just simple, delicious, affordable, um, fun food, if that makes sense. Um, so we're not like super fancy restaurants. We're also not super casual restaurants. Um, what differs is, yeah, there's a duck duck goose in Baltimore. There's a duck duck goose in DC. The menus are different. You know, it's two different clientels. And I, and I think that being mindful and respectful of that is what's helped us be successful in those two different markets. Yeah, you, you definitely have it all covered. Now, what invaluable entrepreneurial advice can you share? Ooh. <clears throat> show up, show up. Half the job is just showing up. You know, exactly. more, so more than half the job really is just showing up. You, you do a lot more by showing up than, than, than just by either quitting or, or kind of tucking your head under the sand. Yeah, good advice. There you go. I mean, you, you speak directly into your brand's identity. Simple. Show up. Can't get any more simple than that. Now, let's do quick trivia. We have about three minutes left, and I would like to get your short answers off the, you know, as they roll off the tongue, okay? What's your favorite cuisine to consume? Diner food. What's your favorite cuisine to cook? French food. Most challenging dish you've ever had to make? 
my culinary school final exam, we had to make a five layer opera cake from memory. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that would have been I'm hard. Still in there because of it. Yeah. Your most popular dish? Beef Wellington. The most viral dish? Uh, we did uh, a pomaligot. Uh, so it's like potatoes with uh, with cheese in it. And you just whip it and whip it and whip it. And then you stretch it like a yo-yo almost. And then uh, you kind of serve it table side. It's just one of oh, those wow. things that people do. Yep. Oh, ooh, that sounds mouth mouth warming and delicious. Now, if you could be anything but a chef, what would you be? Doctor. Interesting. What's one fact that people do not know about you? Mm. I played the violin. <laughs> there you go. I love it. Okay. Well, we are out of time. What are, What are the next current projects you you're working on? I'd love to know and promote promote you. Uh, we've got a we've got a book coming out called Just the Tips. It's about my life in the restaurant industry, um, or just I shouldn't say my. It's about life in the restaurant industry. Um, we've got uh, we've we're almost there on a prequel TV show. I can't say what it is yet, but but we're we're knocking on its door. Um, we've got a couple other restaurant opportunities that are looking us in the face right now. So big things for this next year. But I will not sign the contracts for the next couple of weeks. That's right. Mercury's in retrograde. Well, thank you so much for an incredible interview. You are so much fun to chat with. Thank you. Absolutely, guys. Definitely check out Chef Ashish Alfred on the ground. That was our culinary and wine segment brought to you by Beach Cucina, but you definitely have to check him out at Chef Ashish Alfred. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Neve, a members-only travel portal exclusively available through Organo, offering members steep discounts on nightly or weekly hotel stays, cruises, auto rentals, excursions, and so much much more. With its travel getaway portal, Nave makes the days of surfing multiple travel sites and spending hours evaluating the best deals done with. That's because with Nave, you are guaranteed the best prices. Plus, to gain access to an even more expansive collection of condos, hotels, cruises, vacation villas, fantasy getaways, and concierge service, there's Forever Weeks. Simply purchase a Nave Forever Weeks package one time and enjoy the benefits many times. With Forever Weeks, forever means forever. Not only does Neve guarantee you the best prices, but it is also one of the few travel portals that pays a referral bonus, in addition to you earning rewards points, which can be redeemed on the Travel Getaway Portal for further discounted hotel room rates. Become a member today and Navegate the world of travel. Neve, the world for you to experience. For more information, go to Neve.travel. That's Neve, N-A-V-E dot travel. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes in our Travel Treasures segment brought to you by Navi Travel, we're featuring Carl Pierre, a serial entrepreneur that has achieved financial freedom through owning home care agencies, healthcare staffing firms, and a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio throughout the world. He aims to teach people how to live globally by building revenue streams that allow you to live anywhere in the world without the pressure of how to pay for the lifestyle that you want. Now, the benefits of travel go beyond making memories and meeting new people. Getting out of your comfort zone and exploring a new place can have a remarkably positive impact on your emotional well-being. Even when traveling far distances can feel uncertain, changing up your daily routine at a nearby town or locale on a weekend day can help to change your mindset and help to ease the stress of the daily grind. Today, we're chatting affordable travel, the importance of traveling and seeing the world, and Carl's tips for the key to success in entrepreneurship. Now, in case you need another reason to explore and travel the world, let me remind you that traveling will open up your heart and soul to cultural experiences and wonders. Welcoming now to the show is the amazing Carl Pierre. Welcome, superstar. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, it definitely shapes me in the, in the right light for the conversation. Absolutely. Well, you are a superstar. So let's jump right in. Can you share your journey from starting out to basically becoming a self-made millionaire? Well, I, I would say my journey starts with my immigrant parents. Uh, my parents are from Haiti. They came to the United States. They decided to go into the healthcare industry. My mom's a nurse. And early on, we started a medical staffing company. And that's kind of where I got my entrepreneurial start. I helped her out because I was the only kid that knew how to use a computer in the household. So I became her right hand. 
We've since grown that company quite large. We do about $12 million in annual rev. And I've gone on to form my own entity, which is called Aidbook. We're a tech-enabled, tech-focused home healthcare company that is starting to accumulate assets throughout the United States. I love it. This is an incredible story, truly self-made. And I love how you rolled up your sleeves and were uh, an incredible son to your mom. Now, how did you manage to turn your passion for travel into a profitable venture? And, and what were the initial steps you took to monetize and create income streams? So initially, my focus was healthcare. I saw it as like a reliable path. My parents never got laid off. They always did fairly well. So my thought was, how can I generate enough money to live globally? The first time that I had the idea to live globally was actually, I took a trip to Thailand and I saw that I could get a full meal for like a dollar and 50 cents in Thailand. And I was like, wait a second, this is the first time that I'm seeing how far the US dollar goes. Because before then I would travel to like Mexico, the Caribbean, and your money doesn't go that far there. But going to Thailand actually showed that there was major currency fluctuations and the advantage of having US dollars. So I started thinking, how could I run a business or invest my way to have enough passive income to live in places like Thailand or really anywhere in the world? And that's what got the gears going. So one of the investments that I had made at that time was that I had two properties in Stony Brook, New York. Stony Brook is a state university, college town. And me and my fraternity brothers had bought a house and then another, and we were renting that out to other students. And those properties would generate between like a thousand and two thousand dollars a month in cash flow. I was like, if I just got a couple more of these homes, I could live virtually anywhere. So what I started to do was all the money that I saved from the earnings of the healthcare companies and working as an x-ray tech and CT tech, I would roll that back into real estate assets. And that first initial number that I had in mind is like, if I could just make $3,500 passively, then I could replace my income and $3,500 in a place like Thailand goes a long way. Wow. But then that number has kind of expanded over time. And Talk about 10xing your business, right? Grant Cardone right there. Yeah, yeah. You are amazing. So, well, first of all, success is not final, right? Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And it's better to fail in originality than to succeed in, in, in imitation, right? So that's something I always tell myself. Now, building a successful business, uh, Carl, obviously requires these days a strong online presence and audience, uh, tons of audience, audience engagement. What strategies did you employ to grow your followership? I mean, th this is quite an amazing journey you've had. Yeah, right now we have nearly 200,000 followers on our social media platform. So on my personal brand, I have about 180,000. Then I have my consulting company, Passive Workforce, that has maybe a thousand or so combined. And then, of course, a, a pretty large email list. My tip for anybody who is in business is that you have to have some sort of online presence. And I think social media helps in a lot of ways. And you don't have to like dance or do anything ridiculous. Usually you as you are, is enough of a character to shape your brand around. Just be yourself and share what you know, because chances are there are other people who are in exactly the same position as you or once were there or trying to get where you are. So you just need to talk about your life, share useful information, actionable items, and then just do it. Because you start when you start kind of creating a, a, a brand, you tend to compare yourself to the most successful brand that you follow. And that successful brand started day one, just like you. Don't compare exactly. yourself to that high production level. Just go out there and start creating. You're going to get better at speaking. You're going to get more comfortable. And then you'll start to see what your audience actually wants out of you. And then you can start shaping your narrative around that. You are so receptive. I love that. And interestingly, because balancing a travel-centric lifestyle like yours with the responsibilities of running a successful business can be challenging. How do you manage your time effectively and maintain a work-life balance? Uh, the the work-life balance is horrible. Uh, <laughs> so um, my day starts at 5 a.m. Uh, and ends at around 7 p.m. Like that's dinner time. And then I wind down and go to sleep. So most of the day I'm working. Weekends I work. And I love what I do. And I get to travel a lot because of business. I have investments in, in other countries and I have offices in other countries. So I, I'm moving a lot. But the work-life balance, um, I still haven't quite figured that part out. 
Um, I, I think the more you put in early, the better off you are later on. And if you're doing things that you enjoy and you doing things that you're good at, I don't think you really need to have too much of a work-life balance. The you'll find like your your middle point. You're right, and it's the journey, not the not the arrival, that matters, right? Um, I, I remember my mom always used to say, "Take only memories, leave only footprints." Um, but yes, this is this is exactly what you're preaching. Now, could you share some of your most memorable travel experiences that have influenced both your work content and your personal growth as an entrepreneur? Oh man, it's it's so many, but I think one that that I've talked about on my channel that was kind of a strong memory for me and my family is that in the small town of Musumeli, they're selling properties for as little as one euro. And wow. I actually went out there to buy these properties uh, naturally. <laughs> I was like, what, one euro? I got I to gotta check this out for myself. This is craziness. Yeah, it's absolute, absolute craziness. Um, but you could get a house in Italy anywhere from a buck to about 30,000, 40,000. Uh, quite easily. So anybody who's thinking about living the Dolce Vita, I would recommend looking at Italy and seeing what you could pick up. But this town, this small town of Musumeli has 12,000 people. And um, one of my friends there is an artist and they were doing this project called the Art Doors. And what ended up happening is that my wife took a picture with me and my daughter walking through this like historic part of town. And one of the painters saw the picture on social media and decided to use it for his Art Door project. So strong memory for me was him presenting the idea to me and my and my wife and asking for permission to use this idea for his door and my wife just breaks down crying and to me it was like a sign of being accepted in this new town because we're totally outsiders we look like outsiders we're right. buying up cheap property a lot of people would think that a small village wouldn't be so welcoming of investors coming in but this was confirmation that we are part of this community and and people want us to be involved and want us to be there what so a beautiful story of... this is italy right wow yep this is incredible it gave me goosebumps that is a truly memorable story now achieving self-made millionaire status in life that's where you are what was your secret if you can if you can share a little tip it's actually pretty easy um to become a millionaire and when when it happened for me, it was kind of like not actively knowing because your your net worth is is just the difference between the value of your assets and your total liabilities. So I'm picking up real estate and company growth. One day we just were reconciling for life insurance purposes what my net value was, and I was like, "Whoa, I didn't even realize that I'm here already." So I think the tip that I have is that you have to understand how value is determined. And if you're if you're not managing that that asset side of things, a lot of people buy things with their money. If you should be spending your money on assets, we're talking about stocks, real estate assets, uh, other businesses, things that that actually have value and produce income. And then you need to keep your debt low because if you have high debt and you have a bunch of assets, your net worth is still low. So it's all about trying to push as much money that you have into the asset column, true assets that produce cash, and then all the additional cash flow, whether it's from your businesses, from your real estate, uh, from stock dividends, roll that back into getting more assets and also keep your, your personal expenses low. I live a pretty humble life. I always have because I always found it to be quite ridiculous to overpay for things. So even in my life today, I live in, I live in like, uh, I guess, pretty nice area in Fort Lauderdale. Average home price is around 1.5 million. But I bought the worst triplex in the neighborhood for land value for 600 grand. I put 300 grand into it. I have $600,000 in equity. I still kept it as a triplex. Me and my family lives in one unit. The other two units are on Airbnb doing $4,000 a month. Wow, that, you are doing the way amazing. That I so I, I, I just say that to people, like people have this goal of their dream house or buying you know, the Range Rover or whatever it is. And I'm just like, well, what are you doing to bring more cash in? And if you're looking to, to achieve financial freedom, you need to set your freedom number. That's the number that replaces the job, allows you to eat and survive. 
There what you can replace your, your freedom number? You're free to do whatever you want. And chances are you're going to start piling more money into what's working for you. And then from there, the sky's the limit. There you go. Well, we are out of time. And with that, that was incredible advice. Thank you so much for being transparent, not only in how you got to where you are at with your investments, but you also gave us some pretty personal information in terms of what you paid for your land and where it's at right now. And that goes a long way. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Guys, you definitely have to check out Carl Pierre. That was our Travel Treasures segment brought to you by Navi. And that was Carl Pierre, a serial entrepreneur that clearly has achieved financial freedom through not only his intelligence, but who he is. Beautiful inside and out. Do check him out on YouTube, Instagram at Carl underscore Pierre, or you could head directly to their website at entplife.com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Neve, a members-only travel portal exclusively available through Organo, offering members steep discounts on nightly or weekly hotel stays, cruises, auto rentals, excursions, and so much more. With its travel getaway portal, Neve makes the days of surfing multiple travel sites and spending hours evaluating the best deals done with. That's because with Neve, you are guaranteed the best prices. Plus, to gain access to an even more expansive collection of condos, hotels, cruises, vacation villas, fantasy getaways, and concierge service, there's Forever Weeks. Simply purchase a Neve Forever Weeks package one time and enjoy the benefits many times. With Forever Weeks, forever means forever. Not only does Neve guarantee you the best prices, but it is also one of the few travel portals that pays a referral bonus in addition to you earning rewards points, which can be redeemed on the Travel Getaway Portal for further discounted hotel room rates. Become a member today and Neve Gate the world of travel. Nave, the world for you to experience. For more information, go to nave.travel. That's nave, N-A-V-E dot travel. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our Travel Treasure segment, in our extended segment, we're speaking with Carl Pierre, serial entrepreneur, achieved financial freedom through owning home care agencies, healthcare staffing firms, and a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio throughout the world. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. So let's jump right into, we're in our extended segment. What advice uh, do you have for individuals who are just starting their journey and aiming to create both a successful lucrative business uh, and also get to see the world? First things first, I would say establish a business in an area that you know really well and make sure that you are addressing a problem that you know. So at one point in time, I was raising money for a company and it was a fashion tech company. This is something I did with my with my ex-wife. And one of the investors was like, I went through the project. I went through your 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 history. Your whole life is in healthcare. What the hell are you doing launching a, a fashion company? He was like, why don't you solve a problem within your industry and come back to me? And that got me thinking. It's like, you know what? We do have a couple issues in our company that I can't stand. Let me create a technical solution for that. So in, in home healthcare at the time, every worker had to have their timesheet signed by the patient weekly. Bring it back to the office or fax it in. And of course, I would create delays in payroll, miscalculations, et cetera. So I created an app called On Time ITS, which we're raising money for now, actually. So if you want to invest, uh, shoot me an email at invest at ENCP Life, and I'll get you over some information. But the problem that we had was that collecting and compiling all this data would result in errors. So I created a mobile GPS app that allowed them to check in at the patient's home, collect the signatures that we needed, and submit them. So no longer did we have to chase people down for timesheets. We got all the data in accurately, all the data in on time, and we're able to do our payroll billing and all of our financial needs quite seamlessly. So the reason I breathe this up is that you asked me, what should business owners focus on? Focus on what you know, solve a problem. Chances are other people within that industry have the same exact problem. And if you come up with a solution for that, you have customers. Wow, that's a great, great... Um analogy there that I love. I love how you tied that full circle. Now, let's chat sacrifices. So what sacrifices did you have to make along the way 
And how do you feel like th that these sacrifices actually contributed to your achievements? I think the biggest sacrifice that I've made along the way in this journey of entrepreneurship is, is kind of time with friends. So right after college, a lot of my friends, they got their jobs and, you know, happy hours, hanging out on the weekends. I worked overnights. I worked double shifts at the hospital on the weekends and I kept my days free to run the business. So my sleeping hours were like from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then I worked the overnight shift and I worked weekends. So I was completely maxed out on work. So what I lost were kind of those early social interactions. I had plenty of fun in college, but that's what was missing. And the fact that I didn't spend my money on happy hours and running up large bar tabs and nightclub table tabs, I had enough money to reinvest in my business. I had enough money to buy more real estate. So the sacrifice that I made was somewhat social, but now I'm in a position that I can travel as frequently as I want. Whenever my friends want to travel, they know that I'm down. So I'm making up for that lost time and I'm doing it without really breaking a sweat financially. So the sacrifice is, is kind of delayed gratification and just kind of holding off a little bit so that that you're not spending your money on junk that's not producing for you. Beautiful. Now, innovation and staying current are essential in your world. How do you continue to evolve your content and adapt to changing trends to really maintain your relevance and popularity? Oh, that's always tough because you never know when you're creating content, you never know what hits. You could kind of study and analyze how people are reacting to different kinds of content. Like new today, it's shorts and reels. Vertical filming. I kind of don't like it. I'm so used to the landscape kind of presentation of traditional TV that filming vertically turns me off. But that's where the industry is going. So you just have to keep creating, testing ideas, learning as you go, and then the results reveal themselves to you. And then you, you start to kind of refine down on, on that. So anybody who's who's trying to stay innovative, just keep doing what you're doing, but listen, pay attention to your data, pay attention to your insights, pay attention to the comments that people are making. Are they asking questions? If right. they're asking questions and there's conversations starting around your short or around even a phrase that you, that you made, that could become a video where you deep dive into that same topic. I'm covering one Euro homes in Italy and people are always like, oh, that's BS. It's a lie. You have to spend so much money on renovations. And that's a common comment. So it makes me say, all right, you think it's a lie? Well, I'm going to film an entire series showing exactly how much it costs, what the final results are and how you can replicate it. So seeing is believing, point. see, seeing is believing. And guess what? People judge a book by its cover. You know, they, they think that everything that glitters is gold or has to be gold. But if you give them, you know, the proof that not everything that glitters is gold, it could be silver, it could be bronze, it could be, you know, people are just very, very um, used to certain ideals and checklists that they follow that if it's outside of their concept of, of, you know, success, then it's a lie or it's impossible to them. So I love that you are actually filming, putting the footage out there and allowing people to get educated by virtue of just watching. So you're educating people and people are loving that in return, which is why I think you're also so successful. Now, you mentioned that you are working on something pretty inspiring, uh, a new project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So being in a home healthcare space, I realize that there's a lot of inefficiencies in healthcare. You, I'm sure you've been to a doctor's office or a hospital. Things move slow, things are archaic, and the patient is who suffers. So in that same vein of thought of solving a problem within the industry, we decided to launch this tech-enabled home healthcare company that puts technology first. And what we do is we run our company with our software and we listen to what our caregivers have to say, what our patients have to say, the things that are causing errors to be made, and we program them out. So right now we're raising a million dollars to kind of 
grow a little bit further to build out our sales team and to also kind of build out our outreach team so that we're getting more doctors aware of these sort of services that we provide and how they benefit their patients in the long run. A lot of people who aren't being cared for properly, especially in their elderly years, will develop chronic diseases that just advance and get worse. We can step in and actually slow the advancement of those diseases by just managing care a little bit better, reminding patients to take their medication, um, watching out for their diet, training our aides remotely through updates and, and video distributions on things to look out for when caring for a diabetic patient. These are all the things that we build into our software and build into our company's philosophy that helps people live more vibrantly and also allows us to de deliver care in a more efficient manner. You've got it going on. Brother, you're you're like you're on fire. You're in beast mode right now. And I love that you are thinking about how to solve these actual problems that exist within these niche markets. And you're you're following your own advice. And actually, you listen, you prove that you listen. That one piece of advice that for that first investor gave you on that, you know, fashion company that said, go figure this out and then come back to me is exactly what what you've done. So I love that, you know, enough to know that you don't know everything. Right. And that's that's the difference between um, people who are successful and people who are stuck in a rut. Yeah, for sure. Beast mode is, is a good way of, of putting it, but it's, it's, I get excited by just taking things to the next level. So our next level is a hundred million dollars in revenue. And we're going to do that simply by expanding on our technology and acquiring other home healthcare companies. A lot of home healthcare companies are owned by old school nurses. So they're still doing things on paper. They're still yeah. doing things in a very family business sort of way. And what we do is we come in, we buy those companies, we allow the owners to retire, and we just make them more efficient. So that's our next phase is improving our technology, acquiring a few more assets, and just keeping that going. So $100 million is our next stop. There you go. 10 extra business. Uh, your mom must be so proud. My mom is competitive. So... <laughs> 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 oh boy, she's, now we know where you get it from. Yeah, she's proud. She's proud, but she kind of like uh she's like if I was younger, if I grew up in this country, you know, I would be so much further. Like she's she's competitive. Really? So. But she, she she certainly is proud. Wow. Well, I love the go go getter in her. Listen, behind every great man, there's a great woman, and it seems like it's your mama. Yeah, my wife too. She's also awesome. oh, oh, of course. Well, you of course, of course. But your your mom was the one in healthcare, right? Yeah, my mom is the one that kind of planted the seed. Planted and, the seed. Uh, you know, I, I love her for that. She she saw the inefficiencies as well. She was working in a nursing home and uh, she was a assistant director in a nursing home and they were using agencies to fill their staffing shortages. And she got a look at the contract and was like, what, they're paying this much? <laughs> and she was like, all right, let me, let me set up an agency, get some of my friends to work. And we'll start filling some of these gaps in other companies. And, wow. and that's where, where it all got started. So thank mom for that. You are quite the businessman. Well, we are officially, officially out of time. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys, that was our travel treasure segment brought to you by Navi, featuring the incredible Carl Pierre, an incredible serial entrepreneur that achieved financial freedom through home care agencies, healthcare staffing firms, and his multi-million dollar real estate portfolio throughout the world. Do check him out on YouTube and on the gram at Carl underscore Pierre. It's Carl with a K. And you can head directly to their website at entplife.com and passiveworkforce.com. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by CO2 Lift. As we age, our skin loses moisture and elasticity, causing wrinkled skin. You can reverse this aging process with CO2 Lift. CO2 Lift utilizes the powerful benefits of carbon dioxide to lift, tighten, and regenerate your skin. This simple, painless at home carboxy therapy treatment is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. You will see reduction in wrinkles, increase in luminosity, and improve pigmentation, sagging, skin tone, and radiance. For more information or to order CO2 Lift, go to CO2Lift.com. 
A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation, or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions, such as OGPay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OGPay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio, every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Or you could head to 710WOR.iHeart.com forward slash a moment of zen. Also remember, we're live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern, on YouTube Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern, and all episodes of A Moment of Zen are now available on Kathy Ireland's Your Home TV streaming platform. You could head directly to our website at mox.yourhometv.com to check us out live in person. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. Thanks again to all of our sponsors that continue to make this show possible. And remember, happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it. Big shout out to our newest sponsors, CO2 Lift and Once Upon a Coconut. We'll see you next week.